live now. Okay, hello YouTube. Um, welcome to our second guest artist talk of Z Festival 2021. Um, I'm thrilled to have a former colleague of mine here, Rudy Hippolyte, um, who is a documentary filmmaker, has been making films over the last 30 years. Um, he's going to be talking uh, a little bit about the last three projects he's worked on um, and give us a little bit of context of how you go through the pre, pre-production process, the production process, post-production, and then of course, answer any questions we have. So feel free in YouTube, ask your questions away in the Zoom, you know how to do that. And uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to Rudy. Thanks so much for being here, Rudy. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter and Shoshana for inviting me to speak at uh, this year's Z Festival. And um, I'm just happy to be able to speak to the topic of document, independent documentary filmmaking. So also, I've, I'm glad I had a chance to speak with some of you, kind of hear your documentary ideas. So that's exciting and hope that uh, maybe in some way you could be inspired, maybe a couple of you to follow through because uh, I, I like the ideas. Um, uh, raise your hands. Uh, I just wanted to find out if any of you are from Boston or know about Boston. Uh, if you can raise your hands. Okay, one and okay. <laughs> so a lot of what I'm going to speak about is, you know, uh, deals with relates to uh, the Boston uh, neighborhoods. So hopefully you'll be able, for those of you not from Boston, you'll be able to find some things out about some of the neighborhoods uh, in Boston. Um, but I hope, uh, hopefully, uh, some of the insights and approaches I can share in my presentation, you can use maybe for your do-it-yourself Z festival projects, or maybe future projects, or a lot of what I, I'm going to talk about just deals with life in itself and relationships and building relationships, hopefully lasting ones. So I know as, as artisans, we all work collaboratively with others, musicians, dancers, you know, visual artists. So hopefully some of this, you know, what we go over can be applied to that. So um, I guess let's get started. So I'm going to share my screen and get to uh, my presentation. And let's see, here it is. And as you might imagine, my talk today, it's going to be about documentary filmmaking building trust and gaining unbridled access. So uh, Creative Buzz Films uh, is my film company, independent film company, and we brand ourselves as Black Boston on film. But before I get into that, uh, Hollywood studio films about Boston, like you may have seen The Town, The Departed, or Goodwill Hunting with uh, locals Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. Well, typically those type films focus on well-known sites or historically white Cambridge and Boston neighborhoods, such as Charlestown, East Boston, and South Boston. The neighborhoods that, that I tend to highlight are other Boston neighborhoods. And usually in these Hollywood films, these neighborhoods are seldom seen in these films, or they're often seen in a negative light in the films or in the news very negatively. So at Creative Buzz Films, as I mentioned, we position ourselves as Black Boston on film, and focus our films on the people and their experiences in Boston neighborhoods, such as Dorchester, Mattapan, Roxbury, and the South End. So these are predominantly uh, neighborhoods uh, with, uh, with Black and Latino families, even though there are, there are many white working class and other families. So, um, so that's what you'll see. So we'll go over. Uh, I, I, I've been doing, I've been a filmmaker for about 30 plus years. So probably older than some of you, but, uh, but anyway, I promise to just talk about the last 13 years and the last three films that I've uh, made. Uh, the first one, This Ain't Normal, which uh, feature film, uh, documentary film, and it deals with young men involved in gang activity in Boston. Uh, it also uh, delves into the streets of Boston a uh, group of uh, street workers and social workers who are dedicated to helping to transform these young men's lives. So that's, I'll be showing examples from that film as we speak about different aspects and approaches. Uh, the next 
is Neighborhood Oasis. So this film deals with black barbershops and salons uh, in uh, Boston and surrounding area areas. We filmed primarily in Boston, but we also selected barbershops and salons in Cambridge and the suburbs. And it, it deals with these barbershops and salons have been uh, really important to the black community for decades. So we, we visited three salons and filmed at uh, three barbershops, but basically we get into some of the challenges these shops face in terms of uh, rising rent, gentrification, and the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll speak more to that um, as later on in my presentation. And finally, the next film that we'll uh, look at examples of is Push Madison versus Madison. So this film was, is one of the earlier of the three films and it deals with an inner city uh, basketball team, a very talented basketball team and whether they're going to go all the way and win the state championship, but it's really about the team and their coach and the public uh, school system and uh, some of the challenges faced therein. So, um, so I should say, as a, uh, I've been a filmmaker, as I said, for 30 plus years. And uh, what I wanted to show uh, is to give you an idea from the earlier film, Push Madison versus Madison, to give you an idea of kind of the production values, the content, and, uh, and so on within the film. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and play this, uh, this trailer as a means to, you know, we do trailers to entice people to want to see the entire feature film. Um, but let me know if, uh, you know, maybe you can unmute yourself if you're having problems. I think it has to do with connection speed. So I think the audio should be fine, but there might be, you know, some issues with the video playback. Hopefully it's not too dis distracting. So I'll go ahead and play this first trailer. Basketball is like life, you know, full of ups and downs and highs and lows and, and, and crises. I've seen people get shot, stabbed. I just want to make sure you guys can hear that. Yeah, it sounds good. Okay, thanks Peter. I lost my mother when I was 12 years old. A couple years later, and that's when I lost my father. What you do when you lose a job? Lose a friend, lose a life. Ain't no college scout recruiting nobody that can't control themselves in a tough, adverse situation. Everybody's running around talking about my hood. This Don't own a that. brick. Exactly, and that's why people are getting shot up over somebody's so-called hood. The suburban kids don't have to be worried about people bringing guns around. Don't have to be worried about people fighting each other. Whereas the kids in the inner city have to worry about all of that. Every double rock, every rock. Who's number one? Check in the nine. Who's the best? Better than the rest. Okay, hey, you. Like you mean it. Like you want it. Like you got it. One more time. There's a reason why we're the best team in the city and in the state. We earned that. The only team that can beat Madison is Madison. We can't make mistakes today, because it's what? Do or die, one and done. Place your sneakers up and let's play. Don't quit on me, man. I've not quit on you. And it was just a lot of jealousy on the team. Everything I felt was going all wrong. You gotta look to pass first before you look to score. People not passing the ball to each other because they want to be in the newspapers the next day, you know what I'm saying? Dudes from He Street was telling him, like, you can't let him outshine you. You know we don't like them dudes. They were from different factions, and they wouldn't pass the ball to each other. Now we're going to get ugly and stop pointing fingers and dog me. I think we understand now. Yes, yeah, so hopefully you get an idea from that particular trailer of Push Madison versus Madison, some of the issues that we deal with in the film, some of the challenges of the coach, the games, and so on. Uh, so which leads me to Create a Buzz uh, documentary films, our mission in terms of the type of films that we, uh, we, we uh, produce. Uh, first of all, we bring films directly to urban, suburban, and rural communities in Massachusetts and across the United States. We do private screenings, public screenings, 
and hopefully uh, at festivals and so on, we can get film distribution. So we just we don't just show it to the uh, the folks in Boston and, and surrounding communities, but we can show it across the United States. Next is we create films that give voice to the disenfranchised and underrepresented by illuminating stories that have been marginalized or ignored. So as I said earlier, usually uh, films, uh, blo uh, big blockbuster films in Hollywood, usually they tend not to do stories like this. Uh, next is we foster opportunities for dialogue understanding and compassion between folks from different communities and diverse lived experiences. Again, we, we, uh, you know, we have different experiences uh, in our lives. So again, uh, try to create films whereby folks can get a sense of how, you know, what it is like to live in other communities. Uh, I recently read about an African philosophy of Ubuntu which translates roughly as a human being is a human being because of other human beings. And what that means to me in, and in terms of our films is we try to humanize the folks in the films. So folks you may be, may, may be demonizing or maybe seeing in a negative light, we get a chance to show them in a different way. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully once we see each other as human beings and relate, we can begin to uh, kind of work together to find solutions to common problems. And finally, uh, with the films, try to educate and inspire audience members and public officials to contribute funds uh, and or resources to initiatives that address the fundamental issues presented in our films. So I I'm gonna show you the trailer to uh, a film that's currently out on different uh, streaming services. This ain't normal, again, to give a sense of um, of the content of the film and the production values. The, uh, the good thing, as I was speaking about, trying to get this film so that uh, we can stay, stir audiences and public officials to action. In this case, we're in the process of arranging to do screenings for the Boston mayoral candidates to see the film and for the Massachusetts State um, Legislature, the Criminal Justice Reform Caucus, so they could see the film and hopefully by seeing the film, it can help move legislation that could, that could bring more resources for youth programs and anti-violence uh, initiatives. So here is the trailer. Boston is small, you know, very small. So you got gangs on every street as long as I'm good with these right here, I don't give a about nobody. Gotta check the bushes, you know what I'm saying? Gotta make sure ain't no new cars on the block, all that man, you know what I'm saying? We definitely on point. Gotta be cautious, man, where I come from, man. If not, I'll be on Channel 7 News, man. We lost our first friend at 15. He died at 15. 2004, lost another one. 2005, lost another one. 2006, lost two more. What I do isn't a job. I have to make sure this kid doesn't get killed. I didn't have nobody that could tell me, Al, you know, selling drugs is bad, stealing is bad, being in a gang is bad. I feel like his life is like a repeat of my life. It's not normal for a young man to be shot. Yeah. Like, that's not normal. These young men really need to see, you know, that positive image of who they really could be. We have to teach the young brothers and sisters in our community what it means to live. Again, uh, hopefully in the film, you're able to see some of the issues that's dealt with in the film, uh, you know, and the experiences of these young men and the people who work with them. So again, uh, same thing with the, the Neighborhood Oasis project, trying to, uh, you know, to show what happens in the barbershops and hair salons that usually others aren't privy to. Um, and uh, the same with uh, Push Madison. So as a director, 
and a producer, I have a particular vision and the type of projects I wish to work on. So I spotlight stories that illuminate the beauty, resiliency, and challenges of people of color from perspectives rarely seen, as I mentioned, in mainstream media. Um, I am committed to creating a compassionate space for this testimony. And uh, being someone who is uh, from Boston, I'm able to have and, and have similar lived experiences. I'm able to work with folks and have them open up to me. So I, I consider myself, uh, you know, uh, very blessed to be able to do this work. Uh, in, I also want to humanize people who are otherwise stereotyped and feared. And uh, this is something that we see with the, you know, the racial uh, reckoning that's happening as a result of the murder of uh, George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, and what's happening to uh, folks from the Black and Latino community. So that's what I'm hoping to do so that uh, we can uh, move away from this rampant cultural distortion. And finally, I think this reframing, especially at this time, is ur urgently needed in a moment for, um, for Black voices to resound. So, so maybe what I'd like to do is maybe stop sharing for a second and come back in and see if uh, any of you um, have any particular comments or any questions at this juncture about anything that I've uh, spoken about. Okay, um, so I guess I'll, I'll continue on. Okay, so I have over the years, I've developed, um, you know, particular approaches, uh, things that uh, I may have gotten from other filmmakers, uh, or things that, uh, you know, that I've been able to develop, or, and it has become an approach that I see, you know, works for my productions. I should say my style of filmmaking is closer to uh, Cinema Verite, the king of Cinema Verite, um, Frederick Wiseman, a Cambridge filmmaker, and uh, not as much someone that's a little more provocative and somebody uh, whose documentaries you probably know, a Michael Moore, which would be more of an expose type documentary. But uh, as I said, over time, these are the approaches I've developed uh, with my films. The first is that's really important is building trust. And I, I'll ex get into detail with each of these later on. Uh, gaining full access, full and open access, uh, always trying to maintain high production values because your films, you're trying to get them shown nationally and they're up against big, bigger Hollywood films. Uh, also managing very low budget independent filmmaking. So trying to do a lot with a little. Uh, telling Boston stories, which usually uh, have national appeal, uh, using an intersectional lens. Uh, integrating humor in very in my documentaries, which sometimes can be very serious and heavy subject matter, and then crafting post-production elements, which is a big part of uh, the storytelling element. So uh, building trust. So what I do is I, uh, the first uh, bullet point here, and I embed for relationship building. So what I do once I, I know there's a particular subject, that I want to capture, then I go in and I spend a month to three months just without cameras, just getting to know people, allowing them to get to know me as a person and as a filmmaker. Uh, I'm a curious person by nature. So I do a lot of observing. I do a lot of listening. And then I ask a lot of questions. So, um, you know, it's, I, I have, I feel like I have the privilege of folks telling me and sharing amazing stories. Uh, so I feel like I have an incredible job as a filmmaker. So by doing this, embedding myself uh, with these folks and in these spaces, it allowed the people to get to know me as a person, as I said, and as a filmmaker. I also share my track record with them, my previous films, what I've done, and what I'm hoping to do to bring voice to their stories and, and the issues that they care about. And uh, then I bring in at the end, uh, members of my crew to do side visits, to look at the location spaces, but also so that the, the folks that we're intending to film 
will get to know um, will get to know my crew, and they will get to know the people. Uh, then the next uh, bullet point here is research relevant topics and data. So before I even approach and go in to these folks, I also do a lot of research, read a lot of you know newspaper articles, speak to community activists, uh, yeah, about the topic, about the subject. I search websites for information if it's a if it's an organization. Try to get as much information as I can, and then I watch films on the subject to see if there are other films and what folks have been able to do. And then the final bullet point here: articulate purpose of the film. So as I mentioned, by being there, it allows me to share my vision for the potential film project uh, and explain how I plan to give voice to the subject matter. So here's an example of uh, for the This Ain't Normal film with young men involved in gang activity, uh, working with street workers. This is an instance where I had built up the trust of uh, the street workers uh, and they had taken me out to the street. So here's an instance when we did bring cameras to film where they trusted me enough to take me out to these young men who were there at the gravesite of one of the young men they had lost. And this was their way, their ritual to, to paying tribute to that person. So normally this isn't a place that they would bring a filmmaker. Um, again, there are a lot of filmmakers who would approach this uh, Street Save Boston group to do a film. But again, they thought in some cases they were looking to exploit the young men. So again, by me spending time and sharing my track record and me as a person, uh, he was able to trust me enough to take me out to this the Lucerne crew, Lucerne in uh, Mattapan, and this is what we saw. Close sight. Close sight. So you know I'm about to get right. Take flight, not me. Blink, bit OG. Ain't shit changed. I'm still popping niggas on E. Oh, it's in! Oh, it's in, nigga! <laughs> Let's go see Tough. Let's go see Tough. What's up? Let's go see Tough. Let's go see Tough. Let's go see Tough. I'm waiting. Let him drink. Let him drink. Let him drink, though. You have to be very cognitive of homicides when, when young people are, are lost. You have to know the dates that they got killed. You have to know their birthdays. Yo, this is yo, this is homie from OP, right? Oh, we were casino. A lot of guys may want to go to the cemetery, but after the cemetery and after a couple of blunts and some drinking, you damn sure better have a plan to where y'all are going next. Because if you know the anniversary is today, and you just let them out of your sight, well, you basically just co-signing what you know that they can really go do. We gotta go. We gotta go to the L. We went to the scout. We gotta go to the L. We and we gotta go to the D. So again, um, hopefully you can see by that, that's the way that they honored uh, the young men who were lost to violence. And again, you know, trying to relate, you, you know, we have our rituals ourselves where sometimes on the anniversary of somebody's death, you will go um, to the gravesite of that family member. So this is the way that these young men honor, honor uh, the young men and their friends who were lost. Um, so again, once you build trust, the next thing is, hopefully I can get full and open access to the subject and the spaces. So by spending time and, uh, you know, again, voicing what I'm trying to do, I'm looking to get as much access as I can uh, to the places uh, and the people. So what, what I do is I identify and get to know the characters of the people. And I try to figure out who is, who is the most charismatic? Because that may be uh, something, again, for film that I want to you know, focus in on. From the people that I'm meeting, who is most knowledgeable to talk about the subject uh, matter and the issues at hand? Um, and then you know, make changes. I have a particular original vision, but by spending time and then going out, that may change. And as a filmmaker, you have to be willing to change if you see that the, the film may be going in another direction. And then identify, uh, it allows me to identify storyline storylines and issues 
and the focus of the film by doing that. Um, actually, I would like to maybe stop sharing for a second. Okay, so one of the interesting things that happened in making uh, This A Normal, so I went into it with the or original vision that it would be a film about the Street Save Boston staff, the staff of street workers and social workers who were working with the young men. And a lot of the street workers were, were former gang members who had you know, done time and were now trying to help the young men who were in that, their situations. So I thought it would be that. What happened with my being again embedded and my garnering the trust is they then took me out to meet some of the young men who they were working with. And they, they're referred to as PRIs, proven risk individuals. Now Street Save Boston, mind you, their, their um, approach was to work with 20 of the most dangerous gangs in Boston. There are about 170 gangs in Boston. I don't know if you know that, but they work with the 20 of the most dangerous uh, gangs as a way to reduce uh, shootings in the city. And then once the street workers had garnered the trust of the young men, then they would offer them services with program coordinators and social workers so that they could, um, you know, they could get services like job training programs, something as simple as a, an ID, because a lot of them were underground and, and they didn't want to be known. So another thing in coming out and trying, trying to then, uh, you know, transform their lives would be IDs. A lot of them needed mental health counseling because they were seeing a lot of their friends, uh, you know, being murdered. So it's like PTSD. So a lot of the, the things that Street Save Boston did were, were actually uh, real solutions uh, for these young men. Uh, but what by, by them taking me out to meet the young men, a lot of the young men started telling me their stories, their backstories, why they were involved in gangs, their family situations. And uh, it just you know, broke my heart when you hear, heard some of the stories, any of us, being brought up in that environment would actually not have many opportunities and, and possibly have to make the type of choices. Uh, because they had dysfunction in their family situations, they, they found solace in the friends, the friends, the neighbor, the friends who, were, who lived next to them, uh, who were in similar situations. So they were willing, nobody was interested in, in hearing their stories, not even family members. Uh, so, they were happy to relate their stories to me. And then I said, would you be willing to say this on camera? And most of them were willing to do so. So at that point, the, my vision for the film obviously, obviously shifted. So it shifted uh, from being a film about the people who work with the young men to actually hearing some of their individual stories. And, um, and still, still covering some of the street workers and the work they were doing and the solutions. But I was able to capture uh, stories of five of the, the young men and then some of the crews from the different neighborhoods. Again, somebody else, you've seen documentaries about, um, about gang culture, about gangs. And usually as a filmmaker in Chicago, LA, you point a camera at these young men and they're gonna brandish guns and they're gonna be menacing because they have to maintain a particular persona, but I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in, in getting them individually and then, and then they open up. Uh, so that, that was something, again, by embedding myself uh, with, this, with the uh, staff, with the street workers, with the social workers, they were able to take me out and felt that I was trying to do something different. So I just wanted to be able to share that. Uh, any, any comments, questions? Yeah, I have a, a question. Um, it might be slightly, I don't know, too technical or something, but I, I, I'm curious, you ask all these folks for consent to say something on camera. Does anybody then change their mind and say, actually, I said something that I don't want to be publicized or in a film, like, can I take it back? And like, how does that process go about? So that, that works, uh, Peter, towards the latter part of the process. So everybody, you have to have everybody sign a release form, you know, that gives you the right, you know, to show their images in any form, promotion, the final feature film. But again, again, I'm a person uh, with integrity. So if 
in a rough cut, you know, I try to have folks see the film. And if someone comes up and says, you know, I really don't want that or what have you, obviously I'll weigh that. But I have the final choice in, in the decision, right? And they know that. I did, I did have an instance in Push Madison versus Madison, uh, the head coach, who I knew as a friend, and uh, which is why when his film was, his team was the most talented, I said, oh yeah, it'd be great to follow that journey. Um, but during the course of uh, the championships, they had made it to the state tournament. Uh, and at the end of the game, they were losing. And he kind of lost it and said the N word to the kids. Uh, you're acting like the N word. And so afterwards, you know, he came to me and he said, can we take that out? And I listened to that and I said, you know, this is all part of who we are as human beings. We're not always under control. These are things that happen. And again, I, I spoke to him and he understood. So it stayed in the film. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, Peter, but I try to give folks a chance to at least look, but ultimately somebody has to have the final choice and usually it stays with me. Any other questions? I guess I'll- Also, I'll on, the, also yeah. on the subject of consent. And thanks so much. Thanks so much for your presentation. I'm learning a lot from it. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm curious um, in the film about gang violence, if you were um, using people's real names or um, changing names or some combination of the two. Uh, that's a good question. So what we ended up doing is using their first name and their street name. So it may be, you know, Travis, Trey Pound, or trade deuce, you know, so we, for the young men, that's what we did. For the street workers, we did use their, their names. So no one had an ob ob objective, but I felt uh, that I didn't want to use the last names of the young men. So that was my uh, choice. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's a, a good point. Again, you're dealing with matters of integrity, right? They're human beings, you're a human being. So you have to weigh everything, uh, you know, um, so yeah. So I will, I guess I'll continue on to the next approach. Okay, so we covered this. So the next thing is production cost. So again, because you know, I'm hoping that my, all of my films get shown nationally, distribution, I'm competing against uh, big budget studio films or independent films. So I have to find a way to differentiate uh, our films uh, from other films. And the way you do that is with the crew, uh, with, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go over some of the things that I try to do to make our films uh, different. But obviously building trust and having open access is the main thing in terms of capturing material that nobody else hopefully can capture. Uh, so, uh, I'll just have up here the cost of the This A Normal film uh, for us, which was be, uh, between 2014 and 2018. So the production crew costs, uh, production equipment, post-production expenses. Again, I do not pay myself for any of these, except if I sell the film, I'm hoping to recoup something on the back end. And the total cost for that uh, is $102,000. So on average, uh, the films that we produce may run anywhere from 60,000 to 110,000. And the average, uh, and usually these are funded by grants. Uh, we do charge a screening fee when we do complete the film and show it in different venues. And then it's out of pocket. Uh, so that's how <laughs> our films are, are financed. Lately, it's been more grants than out of pocket, which I'm happy about. Um, but the studio and independent films, uh, documentary films on average cost maybe a half a million to $5 million, and it could be even uh, much more. So we have to do a, a lot more with a lot less. So the approach that we take is um, we try to maintain high production values with uh, what I say compelling, compelling content. So um, what I do is we do cinema verite style capture. So we capture all video. We try to capture as much in these spaces and with people as we can. So we film as much as possible and hopefully at different points, we can capture the essence, atmosphere and the powerful interactions that happen uh, in these films. So for example, uh, 
the cinema verite style for the Push Madison film. We went in and we filmed as many practices as we can, regular season games. We did a lot of pre-game speeches, the half game speeches, after the game speeches. So we had that type of access. Then we, we, we filmed the different uh, tournament games. The coach was a history teacher. So we went into the classroom and we filmed some of that. We filmed in the high school. So we try to capture as much as we can. Hopefully we can have some real gems uh, you know, once we get to the editing process. For this ain't normal, as I mentioned, I spent uh, time in the street safe offices at the street safe uh, street, street workers uh, daily meetings. I met with program coordinators, social workers during their counseling sessions, and most of all spent time uh, obviously on the streets with the street workers and the young men they were working with. And then for the current film, which is still, uh, we just wrapped up principal photography, for, so now we're in the editing process. For that uh, film about uh, 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 barbershops, we filmed at three barbershops and three hair salons. And then uh, we started filming the summer of 2018. Uh, and then we just wrapped up filming. We did also, we're trying to tell stories outside of the indiv individual barbershops. So we're trying to tell uh, uh, different uh, individual stories as well. Again, to make it different from films that you may have seen. So uh, again, as I mentioned, managing low budget documentary filmmaking. The key to this is to, um, again, have a resourceful, creative and flexible freelance crew. So I feel like we have the best uh, you know, um, cinematographer, uh, audio engineers, editors, you know, uh, music composers and so on. People I've worked with who like working with me and I love working with them. So again, they bring a lot of resourcefulness to for you know having a low budget, extremely creative, and I'm sure some of you, as uh, composers, choreographers, visual artists, uh, come upon folks that you work with that you love working with, and uh, you continue to work with. We also try to rent all of the production equipment, so I'm not able to afford to purchase cameras and lights and all of those things. But you can negotiate pretty good deals with vendors in the area. For example, if you rent, um, if you rent on weekends, uh, you, you get to use equipment Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for a one day rate. So that's one thing. If a lot of uh, your action happens on the weekend, you can really save a lot of money. Um, try to film with, as I said, the latest equipment. So always looking right now, it's the 4K digital cameras. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, finding you know, creative ways uh, and different ways to present uh, content. Um, so one of the, the things that we do is we film everything with two cameras if we can. Uh, so we, if, when we're doing interviews, for example, one camera is always traditional filming uh, a frontal view of the person. The other camera is always in a profile or a side view, almost like a voyeur. So you become an audience member uh, uh, looking at as if you're looking into a space um, that you wouldn't ordinarily be privy to. So those are just some things that seem to work. Also, um, specialized battery powered LED lighting, soft lighting. So if we do need to film outside as we did with this a normal, uh, we don't have to uh, plug in or, or look for AC power. So it gives us a lot of flexibility and a beautiful look. And then we just recently purchased a drone so instead of my paying for stock footage, we're able to get really beautiful cinematic, cinematic shots of the city. So it looks like it's a much more expensive uh, film than it is. And then, as I mentioned, um, I, in embedding myself, I end up being the person who conducts all of the interviews with the subjects. So I know exactly what questions I wanna get answered, who's gonna be able to give me the information that I need. So here is an example uh, from the This A Normal uh, film, uh, which shows like the effectiveness, I, I feel, hopefully you do, of uh, LED lighting. We did the street workers interview, nap uh, at night um, and try to use a couple of different angles. And he talks about uh, what it was like for him, you know, when he first uh, joined a gang. So I'll play this. 
Bad man, fighting every day, fighting, uh, segregation. I spent almost a year and a half in segregation. Um, segregation is jail within jail. You're 23 hours in the cell, one hour out a day. It's all hell. The COs is disrespecting. Every time I come in, the COs is like, oh, you're back. Joe is special to me, man. And you know, once I won Joe's respect, I won everybody's respect. He said, Nap, dude, you ever been in the game? And I said, I didn't want to answer the question, but you know, I was keeping it real with him because I seen I had his, his attention. I said, yeah, I, Joe, I was in the gang, man. I started in the gang when I was nine years old. It was about 10 of my cousins, and they said, you gonna be a part of this, you gotta get a tattoo. So we went down into one of my, my cousin's basement and we, we got tattoos. Um, we drank some, some liquor called Martel. And then my cousin put us in the car and said, yo, we got to ride. And um, I, I, I shot my first individual when I was nine years old, man. So again, this is, uh, you know, some of the folks that make up our uh, do documentary team. I, again, I just consider it an honor to work with some of these folks. And from that scene, as you can see, you know, in terms of sound design, in terms of camera, in terms of lighting, um, I feel like, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't take away from the content of the film. It really enhances it. So again, a lot of folks that we work with over time that work on a freelance basis, when they're not working with me, they're working on their own projects, they're working on studio films, um, you know, they're working on corporate films, they're, so they're extremely experienced and extremely resourceful, uh, as I mentioned. So we just covered uh, visuals. Now, again, as a filmmaker, I give equal importance to audio capture. You can have, have the most beautiful visuals, and if you don't have good audio, forget about it. So one of the things we do is we have an audio engineer on site. So when we are capturing, that person uh, usually has his own mixer, usually a sound devices mixer. And usually we try to, to mic three or four of the uh, subjects with lavalier microphones. And then we use a shotgun microphone to capture anyone else who uh, may not have a wireless microphone. And this sound engineer does a live mix that we send to the cameras just so that we can log footage, but they record each microphone on separate audio tracks um, with their digital mixer. And that gives the editor uh, flexibility to choose any of the audio uh, in post-production. So that seems to work out really well. And again, uh, we have incredible audio engineers we work with that are able to do this type of audio capture. So what I'd like to do next is to show again with so many um, microphones happening, this is what happens. This is a scene from one of the, um, one of the hair salons, uh, Cookies Hair Solutions uh, for the Neighborhood Oasis film. And again, I always say that um, you know, Hollywood writers could not write what you can get in these natural settings from folks. So again, I consider myself just fortunate to be able to have people tell stories and to be able to share things uh, like you will see uh, from this particular uh, cut. So here we go. This is a discussion in the hair salon about Bill Cosby. But in these uh, barbershops and salons, you have here every discussion that's happening, political, uh, you hear about every, everything sports, and this is just one of the discussions while uh, in this uh, particular hair salon. Now look at this. I'm just gonna I'm skip. Saying, I don't you know, know, I have no say. No, let me just say something. Let me just say something. Not just because he's black, I am not gonna say you're a black baby. Let me say something. Yes. 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 Yes.
listen. I'm not patting no pet files on the back. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. He's a sick man and he needs help. Yeah. No, what I'm saying about Bill Cosby is that what he did was wrong. Yeah. I'm not disputing that. I'm saying, but they're going so hard on him. What about those that have when killed you murder over person, 20 people? You take a life. Right. And that's a devastating thing. Right. When you molest and you pedophile somebody, you take yeah. their life too in another yes. way. Right, absolutely. So we cannot yes. just act yes. like what this man has done is not that serious. No, it I'm not saying is. it's not serious. These women's lives have changed. Right. Imagine when you get molested at a, yeah. at a young age, you can't live life. You right. don't know right. how to live. No, you don't right. know what to exactly. do. You don't know what right. to right. do. So right. imagine the exactly. internal that they right. dealt with. But Bill Cosby, exactly. bump him, he is not a topic. He did wrong. I'm not saying that what he did was right. I'm saying that they should have gone just as hard with all the other ones that did they're the same thing he's done. Out. And they're not going to because of the color of his skin. Mm -hmm. yes. You know? Okay, so before we speak about the post-production elements, maybe I just wanted to stop sharing for a second and see if uh, anyone had an, any comments or anything that they might be able to relate to in any of the projects or any of the work that you're doing. Rudy, could you talk a little more about how that scene was uh, audio captured? Sure. Some of them had mics close up then? Yes, so in this instance, uh, the, uh, the owner, Cookie, who's doing the woman's ear, she has a mic, and then we have mics on two, again, we're not sure who we're gonna get in this instance, these are just folks coming to get their hair done. So in this instance, we had uh, one other mic on the young lady to the right, uh, and then the shotgun mic. So, and then, as I said, we recorded everything separately, there's a live mix that happens to the cameras. So, so again, the editor can listen and then be able to pick up whoever, you know, primarily takes over. But at the beginning, it's chaotic. And, you know, again, we have, this is still a work in progress, by the way. Uh, so this is just for grants and so on. Our editor put this together. So obviously there's a lot of chaos that happens at the beginning that probably will be different uh, with the final edit. But yeah, we captured everything and then the editor pretty much picked and chose. Uh, normally, uh, we would mic th at least three or four people primarily. Um, in this case, I think we only mic two um, and then the shotgun mic. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, you're trying to capture as much as you can just as with the two cameras, you wanna capture as much as you can with the audio. But in this instance, it's verite. So you have no idea what's going to happen. And, and, you know, every so often I'll stop if I see something and say, okay, let's put the mic on that person. But you try not to interrupt the flow of things if you can. So I think I have like 15 minutes because I want to leave enough time. So I may need to skip, you know, uh, uh, skip uh, different slides and videos uh, to get to the end because I definitely want to get your questions, feedback, what have you. So. I guess we'll continue on. Okay, so this is like critical for me, the post-production elements, because without the type of people and equipment and so on, there's no way we could uh, compete, as I said, with a bigger film. So I have an incredible editor who is out of New York and he's just able, you know, I'm an old style editor, kind of traditional, and he's able to bring uh, kind of a nice cut, seamless uh, storyline uh, to it. And we kind of mesh both and it seems to come out, um, you know, to where, uh, to where we want it to be. Then integration of motion graphics. So usually for the opening or for the lower third credits to ID folks, we usually try to see if there's a theme or motif. In the case of, for example, This Ain't Normal, there were a lot of clips uh, about what was happening with gang situations and so on. So we kind of tried to integrate that into the motion graphics. Uh, again, I'll speak a little more to this, but all of the music is original by our composer and his team of musicians. And so I work closely with the composer, as I said, work closely with the editor. And then uh, because we purchased our own drone, 
uh, now we're able to go and get the type of shots we want and not just go to stock footage and try to choose things that may not be quite what we're looking for. So here is uh, again, uh, example of uh, motion graphics, an example of editing, um, example of original music uh, for this particular piece. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I'm just gonna show a part of this and then probably stop. So this is from uh, the, the documentary about the basketball team, Push uh, Madison versus Madison. And this is uh, the opening montage for the film with the credits. Beings in our camp. Knowing the battle's realistic, we lean on each other so we shatter statistics. Not one is to fathom a mystic. Move with certainty. Who wants to challenge to give strangers and enemies to allies? To the family ventures used to bang on them boys, now we bang on them boards. Witness your success and wanna hang with yours. Become the winning team, travel, change our shores. When we focus our minds, can't remain the poor. And with that positive spirit, we remain on tour. So again, as you can see from uh, the motion graphics, because we started filming uh, a little way, halfway through the season, we wanted to show that this team was, you know, on, was, not, was undefeated. So we used the newspaper clippings as motion graphics in the opening to show, uh, to illustrate that the team was very talented, undefeated and so on. So that was incorporated and again, the music composer uh, came up with, um, with the theme music for the film. Uh, so the next thing I try to do, uh, we're telling Boston stories with national appeal. So again, even though these stories about Boston, they resonate nationally. Boston is a microcosm of the rest of the nation, I'm finding out. So a lot, a lot of the films that we do, even though folks in our community are really happy, to see it, it actually has uh, national resonance. So for example, for the Push Madison film, again, you've seen many films about talented inner city high school basketball team, journey to a championship. Are they gonna win or not? You've seen uh, films uh, shown about the disparity of public, the public school system in cities and uh, some of the challenges of low-income families. So again, even though it was local, it had national appeal, because of these, these, a couple of these different themes and elements. Uh, for, for the film, This Ain't Normal, about young men involved in gangs, there's a prevalence of gangs and gun violence in major cities in the US. Uh, so in every major city, you have this issue. So again, there's interest nationally in the subject matter, a fascination with gang uh, culture. So again, that's the national appeal. And for the most recent film, on black barbershops and hair salons. That's a subject that you've seen in narrative films, major Hollywood films with Ice Cube, Queen Latifah. Uh, you know, you get to see films and people are interested. Uh, and again, there are things that go on in barbershops and salons that a lot of folks aren't privy to. So there's, a, there's that element to it. So I think the other two films were shown nationally. And I think there's a lot of possibility for this uh, film on black barbershops and hair salons. I've, I've been uh, fortunate that Push and Tan, as I mentioned, they're feature films that have been received nationally and in North American distribution. Uh, so it's been shown on ESPN, uh, classic on Magic Johnson's Aspire 
cable network on PBS World Channel, uh, satellite networks, AT&T, DirecTV, um, Dish TV, Verizon, Fios, uh, and on different streaming services, VOD platforms like iTunes, Google Play, YouTube Movies, Vudu, and so on. So I'm, again, very fortunate that some of the stories we've been able to tell have had national appeal and have had uh, national distribution. So again, again, to show all the different elements that go in and why we try to maintain high production values with an incredible uh, slate of uh, artists uh, that contribute, uh, I'll show part of this. This is the opening montage for This Ain't Normal. Again, motion graphics, original music, editing, and so on are displayed. gentlemen you know what it is it's 10 o'clock straight up touch 106.1 fm you know how we hold down the city we feed the streets the home of the underdog nothing but great boston slash new england hip hop i got talks to me i try to listen to listen what i to say the devil on my left god on my right shoulder god telling me boston is small you know very small so you got gangs on every street just on in this area right here alone and it's not that big, man. This this block from from Hancock to Geneva is probably six blocks, seven blocks. And out of the seven blocks on both sides, you probably got a total of at least eleven gangs. There's a gang right here. There's a gang next to this street, and then there's a gang next to that street. Then there's a gang behind that street. And then there's two more gangs on this side. So just this area alone, there's about six or seven gangs, and that's a three block radius, four block radius. Boston. It's a five mile radius. You have at least six boroughs. You have Mattapan, Dorchester, Rosbury, South End, High Park. Okay, so as you can see from that uh, clip, incredible, the com you know, music composer works with his team, comes up with original music, a soundtrack for the entire film. As you can see from the motion graphics, newspaper articles that, that, uh, that uh, delve into what's happening in the city around uh, gang violence. Um, you see how the, the lower thirds are used. Um, and uh, as I said, aerial shots of the city. So that, and then obviously the editing uh, of, uh, of the opening. So the next thing uh, for my films, there is no narration. There is no famous narrators. Uh, so I seldom conduct interviews with so-called experts in academia, public officials. Um, so you'll see no, as I said, no narration or famous narrators. What I do do through interviews is I use the subjects in the films as a substitute for narration. So I feel like the people I'm filming about their issues, they are the true ex experts of their lives and they're best able to address the issues or detail re relevant statistics that normally would be stated by a, by a narrator. So in that instance, I have uh, this example that shows both the street worker Leroy Peoples and uh, Jordan, one of the young men uh, referred to as Trey Deuce, uh, you know, giving statistics about crime 
and Leroy speaking about uh, athletic wear and uh, how gangs use athletic wear to identify uh, each of the different crews and how that could be dangerous for any other young person walking into that neighborhood wearing that particular hat. So I'll just show this example. If I'm wearing a baseball hat and we're wearing this hat to represent our hood, our neighborhood, that's what we're doing. But if that 12 year old is wearing that hat to match with his Jordans, that's not what he's doing. He's wearing his hat as a fashion statement. But the problem is he may cross territorial lines that he has no clue about, no clue about. And here he goes, about his business with his matching hat and his Jordans and gets killed. Now, whose fault is that? Yeah, you should be able to wear whatever hat you want. Unfortunately, that's not the merry good old world we live in. Boston is small. It's about 75, 80, 75 killings a year. That's just, Boston, yeah, I know. That might not seem like a lot to other cities, like, you know, Chicago. We could look at Chicago, 500, Men die a year, a year. That's in Chicago, Tennessee, Tala Tennessee, Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee. 188 bodies a year. T New Orleans, Louisiana, New Orleans. 257 bodies a year, and they're not even talking about the ones you. They can't even find when you dump them in the with, with the with the with the crocodiles and alligators. So again, as you can see, both uh, from uh, Leroy and Jordan, they take on their role as a narrator uh, dispensing information or statistics uh, to the audience. So I think this is much more effective. It may not always be 100% accurate, but again, it gets the information across. Uh, so that, and then uh, the next thing I try to do, I use an intersectional lens. So I'm very cognizant in my films how women are represented and ensure their voices are heard. Um, so in This Ain't Normal, you'll see several of um, the folks that we work with who work for Street Safe. They are featured in the film. Uh, we, the mother of one of the young men involved in gang, Beverly Mayo, talks about her story, her backstory. And Dr. Thea James, uh, a physician at Boston Medical Center, who kind of talks about uh, working with these young men and about their, you know, what their lives are like. So again, for the current film, The Neighborhood Oasis, I felt it was really important for me to be able to uh, film not just at barbershops, but at hair salons. So we filmed at three hair salons, three barbershops, because I wanted to be able to uh, juxtapose one against the other. So, um, so that's something that's really important to me in my filmmaking. So here's an example of Omira Alessia's story. She is a social worker or program, direct, uh, program coordinator who worked with one, uh, several of the young men from Street Save Boston. And here is her particular backstory, again, which probably informs as to why she's doing this type of work. When I was a kid, when I was about two, almost three years old, my father, um, who was um, a petty drug dealer at the time, um, he was robbed and murdered. And shortly after that, my mother had a really challenging time raising my older sister and I. And for much of our formative years um, and well into my teenage years and even into my adult years, my mother's been a drug addict. And so I know personally what it's like to grow up without a father. I know personally what it's like to grow up without a mother. And so, um, you know, I had to really dig deep to decide what kind of life I wanted for myself. And um, I knew it would be a challenge, but I really wanted to rise to that occasion. And I really wanted to, to see how I could, you know, make a way out of nowhere. I wanted him to know that although he felt at the time that he was a product of his environment, 
that you don't have to be a product of your environment. There's strength and there's pride in, you know, making decisions for yourself and deciding that you want to live in a, in a better way. So again, important to be able to, to hear those voices as well. Um, I, again, integrate a lot of humor in my films at different points uh, to offset the serious content. Cause I wanna, it's such heavy content. I wanna give the audience members a break. So I try to introduce humor uh, that we've captured in cinema verite style when appropriate. So um, I'll show a couple of quick excerpts and then I know I'm running out of time, so we'll wrap up pretty soon. So this is from the barbershop film, so I'll show 30 seconds. My man looked like the dude sitting in the chair in the movie Get Out, don't he? No one ever said that. <laughs> he looks just like him, right? <laughs> Look at him, he got that smile too. Oh my God, if you pull up that movie does, Get Out, yeah. Google your phone. You, yeah, the movie Get Out, he looks just like him. When he's sitting in that chair. Yeah, and that little teardrop. The lady's doing the uh, Yo, Caleb, poke him in the eye. <laughs> Make him cry. <laughs> It just threw me off for a second. I was about to leave. So that's just a quick excerpt. And then here's another, uh, again, I say, you know, you film everything and you come upon things, right? So here's when we're filming at one of the games, kind of pre-game atmosphere, and just came upon this situation. So I'll show a little bit of the beginning, but then I'll skip, a, skip forward. Mr. Hustle, Mr. Football, uh, Chris Harris, a player, I respect Chris Harris, he can score, he got big heart, and he's going to what? Play to win. Uh, Anthony Brewster, another potential shooter, okay, if he's on. We know the kid Ike, scared to death, but if you let him get rebounds and putbacks, B, then he will get layups and he will make them. Anybody can make a layup. Ray Charles and Steve Wonder can make a layup, okay? All right? That was a joke, you can laugh. <laughs> okay. so I'll just skip forward. Doesn't get any better than that. Again. Oh, any better than that. Oh, a little so night players about that the know the meaning and significance of a city championship. I tell you, it doesn't get any better than that. MC! All the way. I'm an inner city teacher working in the hood with inner city children who are really very good. Most of the time, I am down with the brothers. But when they misbehave, they have to call up their mothers. The mothers say that I'm okay, and they don't want their children acting up that way. They want them to be proud of the way that they are living and to walk out with magic. And Mike Len Cribben, MP, MP! Okay, so as I said, we just were filming everything and came upon uh, these teachers. Uh, then quickly, uh, you know, crafting storylines, as I said, being able to be flexible uh, in changing original vision. Uh, when I'm working with the editor, I create what I call a Bible. So I look at all the cinema verite footage and interviews, and then I come up with a storyline for each of the pr primary characters in the film. I share that with the editor. And then usually we're talking about 80 to 100 hours of footage. So usually I share the Bible with the editor and then we work closely uh, to formulate different storylines. Story um, for the film, we begin to intertwine storylines. So there's a lot of uh, rough cuts going back and forth until we get to a fine tune edit. So I, you know, it's, it, we work very closely together, a very arduous uh, process, but you can, kind of see the film coming together. And then obviously we're trying to humanize the characters by showing scenes where the audience can relate. Uh, so this is the last, uh, actually we're running out of time. So I'm gonna show a little part of this and then we're just gonna uh, just move on to a couple slides and that should be the end. Give me a straight answer. How long you, I'm cutting your hair? Right. I, I'm giving you my service. 16 years with your fire fight time. <laughs> <laughs>
He fired me about six times. How much time he say? Six times. Six times. I come running back every time. No, Never back. call him one time. Ooh. Every Ooh. time, Ooh. come running back. Uh, it's like you're leaving your wife uh, and then going right back. Oh. <laughs> There's a lot of new faces I see in here because we've seen a lot of different ethnicities coming in slowly in the past years. First time I came in here was, uh, was during the basketball playoffs and just listening to just like smarter conversation that I would have gotten sitting home watching ESPN. That was just like, oh, this is where I want to be. This is this is fantastic. <laughs> and then I, when it came out looking dope as hell too. So win win. <laughs> 1973, the Corey Law came, so now with Corey Law, okay, you commit a crime, now we don't have to hire you. I'm an organizer in the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, so it's it's just on my mind all the time, you know, like, reparations. So you're disgusting. trying to raise, raise awareness amongst white people now. Yeah. Their responsibility exactly. what has happened to a whole group of people. And not just awareness, but like, raising resources and like I could connect anything to why white people are reparations. Oh, you have the hairspray. I got that stuff as the gel. Oh yeah? Yeah, I got your recommendation. Oh, but you it, got, got to be but I never got it to look like the way when I left here. Oh. It's probably just like the magic touch of the barber. <laughs> I love coming here because I love the energy. I love the atmosphere, like how everybody is like family. It makes me feel good. It makes me want to come back when someone's like that. Their energy like that makes me want to return. Right, Juju? <laughs>So again, you know, getting back to post-production elements, obviously big music, sound design, graphics, um, you know, illustrated by the prior cut, you know, quick editing style, intersecting, intertwining storylines. Uh, as I mentioned, I collaborate closely with the music uh, composer and their team, um, and, you know, share scenes with them early in the process and, uh, you know, working with the sound design engineer and so on. So again, lots of people contribute. Uh, so it's a very collaborative process. As I'm sure, you know, each of you working on different things, it, it's uh, collaborative in nature. So this is the last quick cut I'm gonna show you again. This is Jordan and his daughter and the street worker Mel at, um, you know, at an arcade. So again, I think this scene, there's humor, but it also humanizes the young man and it doesn't sugarcoat anything. So I love this scene. Jordan to say to you, Mel's my mentor, he's like my father, but I don't look at it that way, you know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be his father. I'm just trying to be someone that he can depend on. You got hold, hold on, okay? We did this the last time. This was fun. <laughs> you scared? Okay, I'll hold on. You just got, I got to make sure you hold on, okay? You got to hold on, hold on with both hands. <laughs> it's shaking. You got to be careful. <laughs> You gotta be careful. Oh, I got you. Ah, it's a bread ball. Some, some hit you. It'll be okay. I'm going to court for my mother now. I'm telling y'all now. My mother's, I say it on national TV. I don't care. My mother's a crackhead. She got five sons. I'm the middle child. If she knows her son, if, uh, if we out here doing what we do, if we don't give her some, we don't give her no money, no nonsense, this and that, we go to jail. We go to jail. Hmm. You know, I'm going to jail for threats right now for my mother. When you put your hands on my daughter, when you was high, whoever my father is, I'm going to say it on Kim, you're a piece of shit, whoever you are. You know what I'm saying? My mother don't even know who my father is and keep it funky. She'll tell you to your face. Yeah, I had, he was a one night stand. When I, she was in college, she left college because she got pregnant with me. I don't know who my father is, but I always said when I have children, I'd be damned I'd be like whoever he was. I'm so sorry. Oh, this is your little roller coaster. So I'll interrupt this. Again, the next thing, Boston is always a character in my film. So I talk about how it's depicted in other films. So I try to highlight some of the beautiful landscapes within neighborhoods of Dolchus of uh, Mattapan, Roxbury South End, try to show murals depicting historical and iconic figures and uh, make cultural connections. 
So again, I tried to show in Roxbury the incredible mansions and three family homes that you may not ordinarily know about. Uh, so again, try to show the beauty of these neighborhoods. And uh, obviously this is, I'm not gonna show this clip, but it, it gets into a scene where they talk about not having a childhood, but it also shows the beauty of, uh, of the different neighborhoods in Boston. And then I try integrating archival footage. So I tried to lend some context. Uh, so for example, in this a normal, I try to provide some context as to why there's a proliferation of gangs in Boston. So going back and getting footage from the 80s and early 90s that show, that speak to the Boston miracle and mass incarceration and how that uh, has resulted in young men not having fathers and the proliferation of gangs. So I don't think we have time to show this, but uh, that's something that I do with our films. And uh, again, filmmaking with integrity, we spoke a little bit about that. Uh, and then doing uh, film festivals, screenings and so on, media coverage in order to get the attention of distributors so that we can uh, not just have the, sh the films shown locally, but also nationally. And I think that's it. Thanks so much. This is uh, contact information, but I really appreciate uh, you guys sharing this time with me and indulging me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Rudy. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we do have a little bit of time for some Q&A, if anybody has any questions about any part of the presentation. Um, yeah, we can open up the floor. Yeah, I tried to jam too much in <laughs> into there, but uh, hopefully you guys were able to pick up some things there. But it's a process that I know works. I've kind of developed over the years, and I'm just happy to be a filmmaker. And I should say, Peter, as Peter knows, I retired uh, from Harvard the end of last year. So I'm a full-time filmmaker. So instead of every five years making a film, maybe we can reduce it to two or three. I have a question about, um, you mentioned um, like, at least in some of these films, like when there are, when there are interview questions, you're the one who is um, out there interviewing the characters in the documentary. And I'm just wondering if you ever um, like include um, footage or recordings of like your questions and prompts or not and why or why not? Yeah, I try not to interject myself. So when, I, when I'm doing the interviews, when we're doing the sit down interviews, I actually tell them, you're not gonna hear my voice asking the question. So I would really love you to put it in context in your response. And that's because I, I feel like it takes, it, you know, that third wall, right? There's this other voice. And I know others do, you know, Michael Moore, there are other filmmakers that do that and it's effective for them. For me, I prefer to let, you know, folks tell their own stories and I'm just, you know, happy that they're able to tell me their stories. And so I don't want in any way to put myself there or hear the question, but allow them to, to respond. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. I was just curious yeah. for that. And I, I'm more behind the scenes person, so I don't, I don't like that aspect of it. I don't even like doing this. So <laughs> to be honest, you know, it's not my comfort zone, but uh, I think it's important sometimes to share things. I have a question that, that might be too big to answer in this time, but like, do you have any anything to say about like how you say you have all this footage and all this these hours of film and like how do you craft a story from that like I know you have a topic probably that you go in knowing that you're going to be talking about but then like how does that become a cohesive movie right so so thanks for the question so it's a it's a, a long arduous process so as we're filming, sometimes I'll start going through footage and logging footage and documenting tra almost transcriptions of interviews and everything. So at that point, I'm beginning to formulate who might be the main characters, what storylines we wanna tell. And that's what I said, I create a Bible and I go down and kind of indicate and where things might be. And then the editor, um, and again, I've had incredible editors, uh, will then, you know, kind of go through my Bible, but they go through the footage themselves. 
And then I, in my Bible, I kind of indicate where the storylines might be and what interviews might be, you know, used for those. Um, and what we did with This Ain't Normal, uh, Shoshana, is that we edited each character's story separately. So we just went ahead and did the whole edit. And then we came together and said, okay, what similarities are there? What connects to what? What does a better job of telling this? And that, that's when we started kind of intertwining the stories together. So that was kind of a different process. Uh, for, for the basketball film, I did the initial editing with that and then I brought an editor on. So I kind of did my traditional thing and then he came in and said, no, cut that, cut that, let's do that. And so it was a different process, but I had worked uh, for a couple of years to formulate that story and I was working alone in that process. I much prefer this process. So for, um, for the new film, I'm, I'm doing the same thing, trying to figure out where the storylines are, but the editor is much more involved and he's already gone through footage and started categorizing things. So I have an idea of where I think the storylines are and I point the editor to that and then they go ahead and begin working on it, send me rough cuts. It's always going back and forth. Does that answer? So, so it's an arduous process, but it's very exhilarating when you, when you get the right thing. And, and you're hitting on the right point. So it's different ways to approach that. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess I'm also, I guess, like as a follow-up, curious if you ever do a bunch of footage and then it doesn't come together somehow, like, or it's too much of a stretch. So how- what, yeah, that happens all the time. Like, you know, when I edited Push, I had a four hour version <laughs> and that's not gonna fly. So a lot of things we, you know, I work with the, the editor I brought on a lot of things had to be cut out. And so things that I was wedded to and, you know, but then it just slowed things down or for whatever reason. So there, and even with this ain't normal, you know, for screenings, I've had to do for virtual screenings, I've had to do a one hour version. So now I have to cut 30 minutes from it, you know? So that's tough, you know, because you feel like everything is important because you've already played it for audiences, you've already gotten feedback, you've already cut it down. But, you know, those are kind of decisions that are tough. But ultimately, if you're working with an editor, and then you're showing it to other people to kind of get reactions, uh, that makes it a little easier. But as a filmmaker, I mean, and I, I know whether you're composing music, or what have you, it's tough when you have to, to cut something out or shift something or what have you. It's a, yeah. It's, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, just as a follow up on that, I'm curious, like you whittle 80, 100 hours of footage down to a two hour film. Um, the rest of the footage that doesn't make it into the film, does that live anywhere currently? It lives in my basement <laughs> <laughs> or in the editors. Cause we have, co- I have copies like, you know, you're filming and you have four copies of everything, right? And you have to, keep one copy elsewhere. So if you have a fire, you don't lose, you know, all that stuff. But yeah, it lives. And sometimes I'll say, you know, we can, you know, do scenes for, you know, our website or what have you, never getting around to it. Maybe now I can, as I have a little more time. Um, But you feel like, like, for example, we have so many stories of the street workers and those could have been their own stories and they're there. And you feel like, you know, you know, that could be its own documentary in its own right. Um, you know, but again, it's just a matter of, you know, we're a small production company and it's only so much we can do. Um, but yeah, there, there's definitely um, things that I'd love to do with the footage. With the new project though, my approach is different. I feel like we can do a series. So I feel we can do a six part series. Again, that's what the distributors, the Netflix, those folks are looking for, you know, uh, series programming rather than a one-off two-hour documentary. So my approach is a little different in terms of what we're capturing and how we're capturing it. Um, only because, you're again, you want to be able to show it nationally. So you, you know, you have to shift in terms of how, you know, we're approaching this particular project as opposed to, you know, this ain't normal other projects before it. But I think, um, yeah, even though, you know, sometimes you see on Netflix a four-part series and it's like, you could do that in two. You could do that in two hours, so. 
Anything else? Um, I have another couple of quick questions. Sure. Um, I'll ask the more artistic related one first. <laughs> Um, and then I have like a money question. Um, <laughs> so you film in uh, verite style. You also mentioned expose. Are there other styles of documentary that you have toyed with or experimented with? And like, how did you come to the film verite style? Yeah, I mean, I, as I said, uh, Peter, I've always had a fascination with people and, and so on. So a lot of the documentaries I've, I'm not the expose type investigative documentarian going. I think it's those type of things are really important to be able to do those type of documentaries um, or to do biographies. You know, um, a lot of what Ken Burns does, he does those type of films. You have, some, you know, Liz Gavis does true crime type documentaries. Um, so I've dibbled and dabbled in different types of documentaries, but always it would be following behind the scenes of maybe a play, a theater play, or following behind the scenes. So, so it's always been about, you know, kind of capturing things that folks may not normally know about, right? Or of seeing the process. Uh, but it just so worked out to where, again, because of my interest in people, and especially uh, in Boston, feeling that wanting to give voice for those who normally wouldn't see, I kind of gravitated to this type of documentary and felt like rather than me picking and choosing what I film, let's film everything cinema verite style. And hopefully, you know, that could be a much more authentic representation of what I'm, you know, of filming. But they're incredible documentarians in our area, in Boston, Cambridge, you know, Errol Morris, I, I mean, they're, you know, Frederick Wiseman, he's kind of inspired me. Um, in terms of this particular genre and doing it this way. Uh, but we're just fortunate. I've, I did the LA thing and just realized that wasn't for me uh, in terms of, you know, I felt I wanted to do my own work and not work, you know, um, you know uh, 20 hour days for somebody else, right? Uh, on somebody else's project. Um, so I just decided, hey, get something that's related to what you do that gives you financial stability and some creative input, but then you can do this on your own. So that's the compromise I made to be able to make my own documentaries on weekends during the evenings uh, until I was in a position where I could retire and do it full time. Um, great, and yeah, just a last quick question. I know we're almost out of time. Um, the people who, uh, exist in your documentary, is there any sort of form of compensation they get if the movie gets big and there's a lot of revenue that comes from it? Right, yeah, that's a good question. So um, again, it's a matter of integrity, right? So for documentaries, we're, we're not able to pay someone to be in a documentary. So when I was looking at different barbershops, I, I looked and I visited a bunch and I had one that they wanted me to pay them to be, you know, to film at their shop. So I couldn't do that, so it didn't work out. Because again, if you feel like if you're paying somebody, then it kind of, you know, the integrity is questioned as to whether they're saying what you want them to say. But the way I compensate folks is, you know, I make sure when I'm going into film that I buy lunch for everybody. And oh, and that for everybody in the shop or wherever I'm filming. And that's a key to keeping uh, the same people working with me, the same crew, I feed them well. Because, <laughs> uh, um, you know, you're not able to compensate them fully for their skills. But yeah, so, so that's one of the things that I do. And then in the other films, if I'm able to sell the films, then I do give them something on the back end, you know, a few hundred dollars if I'm able to. But usually I'm barely even to able to recoup my out-of-pocket expenses. I'm not going to be a millionaire doing this, but that's not why I do it. Um, so that, and the other thing I do, for example, this ain't normal. When we do do screenings, I invite some of the street workers, coordinators, or, you know, uh, folks in the film to come and participate. And then because we do get paid to do screenings, they're able to get an honorarium for coming. So that's how I'm able. But yeah, believe me, if I'm able to sell it, for a few million, everybody's gonna, everybody's gonna be taken care of.
But at the outset, no, no one, you know, you're not supposed to. That's not the reason for doing it. That does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that does. That, that's very uh, clear. Thank you. Yeah. But um, folks are so generous with their time. I mean, they just like, oh, the fact that you're you're gonna tell their story and they feel like you're doing it in a way that they really appreciate. For sure. Well, it is two o'clock Eastern. Um, <laughs> If there are any lingering questions, I know Rudy put up his contact information. We can uh, get that from you later and distribute that to our participants. Sure, I'll be happy left. to. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here, Rudy. This was really wonderful. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure other people did as well. Yeah. Um, well, thank you guys so much for taking the time, you know, to join uh, today. And um, I'm really, you know, appreciative of, uh, you know, anyone who is you know showing up to find out more and learn something about something they don't know uh, so I pre I'm appreciative of that and I know with everything that we do it is about relationships and building trust building relationships uh, in life family not just in the work that we do so I hope uh, some of the things anything that I've said inspires you in the work that you do going forward and in the life that you live Great.